Hi, my name is Emma and I worked with Dr. Yan Wong to develop Neurostim. Neurostim is a compact, affordable and accessible neurostimulator that is capable of producing novel pulse shapes for stimulation of the visual cortex in bionic eye experiments. Approximately 2.2 billion people live with some form of visual impairment, with 39 million people living with complete loss of vision. Anxiety and depression are major public health concerns and these disproportionately affect those with forms of vision loss. That's why Monash Vision Group is developing the Bionic Eye, a bionic vision prosthetic that will be capable of restoring vision to the blind by directly stimulating the visual cortex. So where does Neurostim come into this? Well, when you're developing a bionic vision prosthetic, you need to determine the best ways to stimulate the brain. There are lots of different parameters such as the pulse shape, the duration of the pulse, and how much charge we inject into the neural tissue. The parameter that I was interested in for my final year project was different pulse shapes. The standard pulse shape used for stimulating the visual cortex is a biphasic rectangular wave. Other fields though, such as the cochlear implant field have found that other pulse shapes such as ramped pulses are actually more effective at stimulating the neural tissue. I wanted to see if ramped pulses and other pulse shapes were more effective in the visual cortex as well. However, the stimulator that we have in the lab is only capable of delivering rectangular pulses. So that's why I developed Neurostim. Neurostim is an Arduino-based stimulator that is capable of producing ramped pulses, rectangular pulses and sine waves, and can be extended to many other pulse shapes. Neurostim is 92% smaller than the current lab stimulator and only 150 Australian dollars, compared to the $18,000 stimulator we have currently. Another branch of my FYP was to collect some data with the current stimulator that we use, the Intan RHS system. This data records the neural activity of a marmoset after it has been stimulated with biphasic square waves in its visual cortex. The data has been analysed and is ready to be compared to Neurostim when in vivo experiments are completed. I'd like to now go through my final year project in a little bit more detail. To do so, I'd like to give an overview of the visual system in the brain. This is a very high level and simplified explanation, but it gives a general idea of how visual system flows through the brain. So to begin, we have light hitting the back of the eye or the retina. From there, light travels up the optic nerve into the lateral geniculate nucleus. From the LGN, this information travels to V1, or the primary visual area, then travels predominantly to V2. There are many different pathways that the information can take throughout the brain. Uh, one example is projecting from V2 to MT. MT provides spatial information from the image. So what happens if a patient is unable to process that information through their retina and optic nerve? Perhaps there is some damage to the eye or retinal degradation, such as the disease retinitis pigmentosa. The pathway from the retina, optic nerve, LGN to V1 is no longer usable. The main idea behind bionic vision then is to stimulate directly into V1. V1 provides a foundation for visual information processing. And if we can stimulate V1, we may be able to recreate a simplified image. For example, on the slides, we see simplified representations of the letters MVG and also a simplified version of a woman's face. These images are created by evoking phosphenes. Phosphenes are small spots of light that we can see when we rub our eyes. The idea is by directly stimulating V1, we can evoke these phosphenes and allow them to recreate a simplified version of vision. So this is the general principle of Monash Vision Group's bionic eye. There is a camera at the front of the headset that feeds information through to electrodes at the back of the brain, and these stimulate directly into the visual cortex. Now, when we stimulate the visual cortex, we always stimulate with square waves. So my question for my FYP was, could other waveforms be more effective for stimulation? So the three steps I needed to take to answer this question were, one was to conduct a literature review to see what had already been done in the field. Number two was to collect some control data using those square waves. Number three was to edit the current way that our software works. So by editing our stimulator, the Intan RHS system, to produce other pole shapes, we could do another experiment and compare that to the control. So first was the literature review. I'm gonna pull out a couple of papers as examples of the main idea, which was that bionic vision hasn't really explored different pole shapes. For example, this first paper looks at evoking different shaped phosphenes, and again, only explores square waves. This review paper from the field of bionic vision in 1998, again, only looks at creating square waves. It does look at stimulating in a monophasic fashion rather than just biphasic. So that's either stimulating just with the cathodic current versus both the cathodic and anodic current, um, but it also just only uses square waves. A more recent review in 2014, again, saw the same thing. 
This time they looked at asymmetric pulses as well, so with one of the phases anodic or cathodic being smaller or larger than the other one. So I went looking at another field. The cochlear implant field at a very simplified level can be thought as similar to how bionic vision works, except instead of simulating the visual cortex, we're simulating the auditory cortex. Now, in this cochlear implant paper, they did actually find that ramped pulses were more effective. So the literature review has found that this could be a way to look at more effective stimulation by replacing the square wave with a ramped wave and considering whether it could be safer, more effective. Next, I had to collect some control data. The stimulator that the lab uses is the INTAN system. There was a marmoset experiment being conducted, so I collected some data using this INTAN system, injecting biphasic square waves of different currents. I recorded this data with the NeuroPixels probes. It was really interesting using the NeuroPixels probes. I put that little tiny electrode tip under the microscope and you can see how many recording sites there are. There are actually 960 sites on the electrodes with 384 channels being able to be recorded simultaneously. So once I collected this data, I had to remove the stimulation artifacts. So when you stimulate with one electrode and record with the other, when that stimulation electrode pulses, the recording electrode is going to record that as a very large spike, as you can see there. So these were removed just with a very large threshold. Secondly, we had to pull out the spikes. So by spikes, I mean neural activity. So when a neuron fires, it produces a spike or an action potential. To find this, I defined the spike threshold as five sigma and extracted any data that went over that threshold. Next, once I've found all these spikes, I performed k-means clustering to separate the real spikes from data that just happened to cross that threshold. As we can see here, the orange shape is what a typical spike looks like, whereas the blue shape seems to be just noise that has crossed that threshold. Once the proper spikes were found, I did check that before stimulation, we had fewer pulses than after, which makes sense. We want to stimulate and then see more neural activity. On the screen is a raster that shows the stimulation times in orange and the spikes in blue. So you can see that there were more spikes after we stimulated. I de-randomized the experimental data. So when we conduct the experiment, we randomize which current we use for each stimulation pulse. So we stimulated from zero microamps up to 14 microamps. And then afterwards, I unscrambled that file to see which trial was which level of current and saw the relationship on the screen. There wasn't a really clear relationship between the stimulation current and the number of spikes seen, but we were just looking to characterize the response at each different stimulation level to act as a control for the later experiments. So step three was to then edit our current system, the intern system. The current interface allows a user to change which waveform they want. This is what I first changed. So as you can see on the screen, the user is now able to select ramp pulses as well. After editing the GUI, I had a lot of trouble actually getting it to output the correct waveform on an oscilloscope. So after trying a few different things, I ended up contacting the original developer, Dr. Reed Harrison, and I found that it wasn't actually possible to edit their system like this. So this was a pretty major setback, and I learned an important lesson about making sure what I wanted to do was actually possible in the first place. Um, so I had to come up with a plan B, and that was to create my own neural stimulator. It had to have a few integral features. It had to be capable of creating those different pulse shapes. It had to be affordable, it had to be accessible and compact. So the design stages I went through were circuit design, prototyping the circuit, creating a PCB, 3D printing the casing, and then testing this design. The first circuit design I looked at was a single op amp constant current source. The problem with this design was while it was very simple, it needed a return electrode to the negative input of the op amp. This wasn't really feasible for electrophysiology experiments and any extra current would be discharged into the brain randomly and wouldn't be appropriate. So the second circuit was a constant current source again using a cascade of class AB Wilson current mirrors. This design was really complex and the transistors to this design had to be really, really well matched. So I went with design option three, which builds upon design option one with a single op amp, but this time using the instrumentational amplifier. In this case, the output current can be in reference to ground, so we don't need a return electrode. It does use four op amps in this design, but one instrumentational amplifier could be used instead. The design was first prototyped onto a breadboard. It worked basically, but then you could see that the purple line, which is the actual final output into the electrode, seemed to be having some sort of capacitive effects. Debugging with four breadboards was really quite tricky, and also I considered that perhaps the capacitive effect was from the breadboards itself. If there were four breadboards, those effects started to really add up. So that's why I decided to put this design on a PCB. I designed this PCB as a shield for an Arduino, which makes it more compact as well. 
In this case, it's an Arduino Mega, just due to what was available at the time to use. So the next step was to do some 3D printing and create a box to house the neurostimulator. Finally, it was time to do some testing. So I used a simplified model of an electrode, which is just a resistor in parallel with a capacitor and another resistor, and then a very simplified model of the brain, which was just one resistor. I also designed a user interface in Python, which connects to the Arduino through the serial port, and the user can select the waveform, like the intent system, send it to the Arduino, and the Arduino will pulse the waveform. So as you can see in the video in the presentation, it can pulse a biphasic rectangular wave, a sine wave, a triangular wave, and those ramped pulses. As you saw in the previous slide, it does generate the different pulse shapes. It is affordable, it's only about $150. In context, the current stimulator that the lab uses is over 18,000 Australian dollars. It's also very accessible. It uses very basic parts that can be found at any electronics retailer. Finally, it's also very compact as well. The Neurostim is 92% smaller than the stimulator that we use in the lab. So the next steps in this project are to improve the connectivity. So to communicate with the Arduino over serial, the Arduino still needs to be connected to the computer. I'd like to develop a fully wireless version in the future, which would increase the portability even more. Next, the packaging could be improved. I have separate boxes for the buck boost converter and for the Neurostim. This could be combined into one simpler package. The current design also doesn't actually have an electrode integrated. I've just been using an electrode model. So having some interface to integrate electrodes into the Neurostim is a future goal. Finally, I'd like to do some in vivo testing with the Neurostim to actually see whether it is more effective than basic square waves. I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Yan Wong, for his continued support and guidance throughout this project. I'd also like to thank Sabrina Meikle and Timothy Philippa for their continued technical support and guidance as well. Thank you guys so much.